Hello, and welcome to episode 70 of the Midlife Pilot Podcast, where we talk all things flying and aviation in midlife. My name's Ben. I'm a pilot here in the Atlanta metro area with a commercial rating. Fly a Cessna 182, we like to call the beast. Uh, tonight, we have, as always, our friend Brian in Nashville, home of the Bachelorette Super Charlie, flying his plane named Lucy, a Cherokee 180. Hey, yeah, Brian. How's it going, Ben? And by the way, I'm really trying to get this uh, Bachelorette Super Charlie thing to take. W- when the guys at Opposing Bases talk about us, it's like the greatest thing in the world, right? And so yeah. uh, to hear them say Bachelorette Super Charlie, now I know it's got legs. So I'm really I happy think, about that. I think we're on to something. I think you might have that. Absolutely. Also with us tonight, coming to us from Portland, Oregon, our fly sport extraordinaire, Ted, who is flying the flight design CTLS, we affectionately call the egg. Hey, Ted, how's the it going egg. out there? Hey, doing well. How are you? Very, very good. Yeah. Uh, we're broadcasting live on YouTube. Uh, we usually do it every Tuesday night. Sometimes we have to make adjustments. We do that at 8 p.m. Eastern time. We have a pretty active chat room tonight uh you can come in and make comments laugh at us uh via text you can uh, ask questions uh it's it's usually a lot of fun the audio podcast is available on itunes spotify and wherever fine podcasts are found be sure that you give us a subscribe a follow whatever the button is uh, on your player um we are starting to get some reviews. Please keep those reviews coming. We love it. Uh, we'll read one on the uh, the feedbacks uh, tonight. Uh, we'll read one of the reviews. You can find links to everything that we have on our website at midlifepilotpodcast.com. That includes our Patreon <clears throat> link, uh, our fly-in link. Everything is in one spot. Brian, what did I forget? Mm, nothing. Ultimately, we just want people to be kind enough to go to our website and press buttons. So I think that's enough. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I can't believe this is 70 already. It feels like just the day before yesterday, it was like 43. Yes. So it's going by quickly. I'm enjoying it. I'm glad you are because you're here, buddy. (laughs) You're not enjoying it as much as, no, I'm teasing. Um, (laughs) I'm glad you are. (laughs) I uh, want to go ahead and recognize our new Patreon members uh, on, in our caps available. We have Jimmy T. Uh, thank you very much, Jimmy. Also in our Hershey bar level, we have Keith C. Um, really glad you guys joined us. Uh, they'll be getting access to our Discord server. So that's, uh, that's awesome. Right on. Uh, should we do the review or we want to wait and uh, get our, our new friend uh, active and, and rolling? Yeah, because here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking we are about to put this guy through the ringer. I yep. mean, and it, it, it's going to be relentless. <laughs> so, yep. So no. tonight we decided to do a, a tailwheel talk. Um, this is Brian's instructor and who also uh, has a flight school with a Cessna 140. If you watch us on YouTube and you see our opening screen, that's his Cessna 140. A beautiful little airplane. So joining us tonight is Ben Lehman of Fly With Ben. Welcome, Ben. We're glad you're here. Hey, nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm ready for the grilling, uh, I, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, we're going to probably do a round robin, ask some questions. Uh, if our chat room has some questions they want to ask Ben, uh, please post it in the chat. Uh, guys, if you don't mind... I'd like to kick it off because um, one doll geek and I have been talking about getting our ratings. We've just both done our commercial and this was that very next one. Um, and I very well might come up to you. I'm not sure yet, but I have a couple of basic questions that I'm really curious about. Um, you fly a Cessna 140, which is the seating is side by side. I know a fly, a lot of tailwheel schools have the tandem seats front to back. And I'm just curious what the, when you're instructing in that environment, what is that like? Is it easier when you're side by side? Um, can, can you give us any insight on that? 
Yeah, they both have, you know, pros and cons to them. If I had, I would prefer to be tandem as an instructor um, because it's just easier. You're both on the same page as regarding where the center line is and the longitudinal axis of the plane. But it's very nice sitting next to the person too. So when they do something wrong, you can just slap them, you know. Um, it's a little harder to do that when you're, if you're in the cub, you know, you got to reach behind you to, to slap them because they're behind you because um, you're instructing from the front in the cub. But, um, you know, I've taught in both um, and I haven't really noticed that people catch on quicker in tandem regarding, you know, versus uh, side by side. I don't, I don't really think that it ultimately matters that much. Would you say that it's, if I were to, buy a tail wheel, it would be maybe even more important if I train in whatever seating configuration that I'll be buying, because I guess it's, to me, it would seem like the the site pictures that you're developing is in that law of primacy would probably come into play. Am I overthinking that? I think you're probably overthinking it a little bit. Um, once you get the idea of, hey, the pointy end has to go in the direction I'm going, it doesn't matter what you're in here, that, that law is always going to apply and it's it's going to be I, I i think you're overthinking it just a little bit yeah yeah okay well sp- speaking of overthinking uh ben um <laughs> <laughs> that seems like a perfect entree for me um no first i just want to tell the audience here i understand that i've been super annoying talking about tailwheel all the time but it's because it really changed everything for me and i owe ben a great debt of gratitude for showing me the way and being such a great instructor. And I also think that there's something about the psychology of private pilot training in a normal, you know, 172 kind of situation where you're so shielded from some of the nuances. The planes have so much uh, give, they're very forgiving. And so on, on one hand, I think that benefits the psychology of a, a burgeoning student because you're just, it's not as bad. <laughs> but I will say that I came out of my tailwheel experience and I told you, Ben, when, when we did this, I was I just thought, this is what I should have done from the ber- very beginning because it just turned on so many things so so quickly. And I wonder, as much as I had trouble learning how to land and in the early stages of training with a 172, I wonder as much as tailwheel learning is maybe harder, I guess, in some ways or less forgiving, if that's what you've started with and that's what all you know, then maybe, and it does force you to, to have that knowledge of the nuance and the longitudinal alignment and the awareness of what you're doing on a heightened level, then maybe I would have gotten there faster. I know that you've trained private students from the get-go uh, in your your 140, and then I know you've you know done training outside of that type of environment. What would you say to somebody that's like us, a midlife pilot? Our reflexes are maybe not quite as good as they used to be, but we are illusory in thinking that we've still got it. And um, um, but we're thinking about getting a private pilot certificate, and they're hearing me say, "Man, if I could do it all over again," you know, last week on our episode, we were or two weeks ago, I was talking about this. That's my only kind of regret about my training is I wish I would have done table from the beginning. So what would you say to someone who, you know, is it more just like get whatever plane you can get and it's fine? Or do you have any position on why it might or might not be better to start with tailwheel? Yes. Starting with tailwheel is going to ultimately make you, in my opinion, and I think the data would back this up, um, a, a better stick and rudder pilot. There are plenty of people who have never flown a tailwheel have only flown tricycle, maybe Ben and uh, Ted sounds like maybe that's the what you all have done. And I'm sure you're excellent pilots, right? Whenever we challenge ourselves though, um, there were, doesn't matter what it is. It could be, you know, moving up to a bigger tricycle or a different, different kind of tricycle, whatever. You know, when we challenge our skills, we become better. So tailwheel is going to do that for you. It is more demanding. It requires a, a more attention to the finer points of flying. Tailwheel pilots tend to be a little bit more old school. And so when you put those things together, you know, you end up with a skill set that is, is a little bit more developed, I guess, probably. If you, can, I say fly whatever you can, right? Like if you only, if you can afford the Cessna 150 and that's your thing, like, I mean, do whatever you can do. 
But if you have availability to a tailwheel instructor and a tailwheel school that could do a private pilot license with you or a sport pilot license, um, I would highly recommend that you start there because you're going to get from the get-go a better attunement with the plane and its longitudinal access because tailwheel planes are dynamically unstable on the ground. And so we have to think a lot differently and have better control of the plane on the ground. There's no room for error because we're setting down a, a, a piece of equipment that's dynamically unstable when we come in for a landing. So it has to be damn near perfect. If it's not, you're going to really know about it. Those moments, as Brian can attest, wake your senses up um, and really make you, you know, pay attention to, okay, what was wrong there? And it's, you know, a quarter, a quarter of an inch movement in the, in the cowling, um, you know, makes a huge difference in whether this is going to be something that you're going to remember it fondly later or something that you're going to go home and just <laughs> beat yourself up over for the next two days. So, well, so let me just, let me just put this out there, Ben. I will say too, that another reason why I always, why I think I realized that I wanted to have done that sooner is because my confidence level as a pilot just went through the roof after that experience. And it's, it's really stuck with me. And then as I continue to fly Cherokee, it's a Hershey bar wing, you know, flying tighter and tighter patterns and just feeling more like I, I can put this plane, even if it's not a tailwheel plane, I'm flying with more authority and, I will put the plane where I want it to be at all times is kind of the mentality I have now, as opposed to feeling like things are kind of <clears throat> sort of happening to you. But, but I wanted to say that, that is my impression of, of what happened. Now, I might be exposing myself here, and this might be the worst day of my life, but I'm just going to do this because I think it's kind of fascinating. But I want you to be completely, we haven't talked about this much, right? I want you with no, has it, I'm the perfect midlife example, right? And so what I would want you to do through your experience with me is I want you to think about what it was about, what did you observe in my experience with you and what of those things might have been more kind of midlife characteristics. Don't be too negative, but I'm just saying, <laughs> but no, but just, I'm just very curious as using the this mutual understanding that we have of our experience in that to leverage a, a greater point of view about the midlife pilot experience coming into it after private certification. Yay. Finally, my opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful what you ask for, bro. <laughs> the reckoning. I've been, I've been waiting for this. I always, I always wait to get all the checks first before I give any critical real feedback. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Um, you know, the midlife pilot or just what to say anybody, you know, over 40, I'll, I'll break it into two groups because I generally, gen, generally have um, younger um, people come to me and I generally have like people over 40, you know, just broadly speaking. Um, and what I notice with the people over 40-ish is it does, I don't know, I think it's a site. Developing the site picture tends to take a little bit longer. And, you know, I don't really know sometimes what what to attribute that to. Sometimes that, you know, some people generally are are, you know, 70 plus and sometimes i think it actually might be eyesight and then sometimes i think it might just be it just takes us right i'm 47 it takes us a little bit longer to to pick things up i have two students now who are 16 17 and they've you know grown up flying flight simulator and that's very familiar with them they do it every day they're playing they're gaming every day all that kind of stuff and um with them it, it's very natural because i think they're 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 just in it every day and their, you know, flight simulator is kind of their life. But I wonder sometimes if some, sometimes if physicality like of eyesight, you know, might play a factor in that. And then also, you so know, the there's, there's probably muscles and, you know, as we get older, things atrophy and not to the degree that, you know, that we notice ourselves, but, um, you know, some of my older students are as proactive enough. Or, or quick enough on the cues, you know, to to make the muscle inputs that are needed um, for those finer uh, details. That does that kind of answer, Brian? Yeah, yeah. And I guess I was just wanted to get a cursory overview of anything I could hold you liable for, but ultimately, <laughs> just um, 
if you have observations about what my experience was, what, you know, what, what do you remember me maybe having trouble with and where did I come into some success and, and how would that be sort of maybe typical for people that are like me? He probably blacked all that out. He's probably got really just <laughs> yeah, completely wasted to try to forget just, it all. But just pay, <laughs> just pay the man. <laughs> you know, I think you're, I would say, I don't remember exactly, Brian, how many hours it took you, but, you know, I just kind of remember some of the um, lessons and things we did. But I think it, you're just above average on, you know, how long it took you to pick things up. But it was the, the cursory over, overview would be, you know, getting you to see that site picture. Everybody has their own kind of struggle, right? It's like some people it's taxing and trying to figure out like, okay, how much pressure on the pedals do I need? Cause they're so used to their own aircraft and what they learned in. Some people it's the flare height. I have another student who has uh, a really cool um, home simulator where he flies uh, jets and that's all he knows. So his struggle was flare. I mean, he wanted, to fl- he wanted to flare 15 feet off the ground because that's all he's been flying. But yeah, so yeah, I, I think very typical of most people, the, the meat of the training focuses on getting you to recognize that the nose is off to the right or to the left and developing the sight picture for, no, that thing really needs to be pointed in the direction of our travel. Otherwise, it's going to be, you know, an extra line item for new tires on the bill when I send it to you. <laughs> Right. Uh, yeah. So we've got a couple of questions uh, in the chat. Uh, Ted, you want to? Yeah, I'm going to take one from uh, from Mark here. Um, and uh, Mark was wondering, taking a, a primary student from uh, in tricycle gear through solo or check ride versus taking a primary student through on tailwheel, would you expect it would take more time? Should they plan on more hours if they were flying a tailwheel, for instance? Yeah, that's actually something I point out to new private pilot students is, hey, this is, um, I just come out and say it up front now, this is harder to learn. That doesn't mean that some people pick it up in normal or, you know, the same timing that they would a a tricycle. Some people it takes longer, but on average, I would say that it takes, it's going to take you a little bit longer to learn tailwheel, Um, especially with, with me. Um, I just say, yeah, it's going to be a little bit harder and you, it's going to take you longer to get to solo because it's my plane and it's my baby and I'm not going to let you solo it <laughs> until, you know, I'm really ready for you to, until you can demonstrate that you're really ready to solo, you know? And so that can be, that can be seen several different ways. If you're at a flight school, they don't, you know, you're going to have an instructor who doesn't own the plane and doesn't have a real interest in making sure that no damage happens to the plane, right? They're like, you're good enough. Like, faster I get you to solo, the better you look, the better I look, you know, um, the more we can brag about it. I'm just not of that crowd. Long-winded answer. Yes. So you should plan on, uh, you should plan on more hours to get to solo. If anybody tells you or makes you feel like less of a pilot because it took you longer to get to solo, remind them that, Hey, you're a tailwheel pilot <laughs> and they're yeah. not. <laughs> yeah. um, but second, but, but second, you know, that's, we we're kind of upside down. I feel like in incentives and aviation training, it's all about speed and it should be about quality. I was just talking to another instructor this last week and she had a really good viewpoint. She's like, I just have blinders on. She's like, I'm a horse with blinders. I don't watch, I don't pay attention to anybody else. I only measure myself against myself. So I, I would just encourage people to think, think like that. One thing to consider is yes, training with me for your private um, and a tailwheel is going to take a little bit longer and it probably should be this way, but I'm, my hourly rate is cheaper than uh, flight schools because I don't have the overhead that they have. I think in the end, it actually comes out in your favor. And, and that yeah. could be true too with um, other tailwheel schools. However, you pay, you get what you pay for, I guess, you know, and um, you should probably be paying more for tailwheel instruction than you are for tricycle, but. We've got another question from uh, one of our uh, CFIs in the audience. Um, how does Ben recognize a pending ground loop? I'd love to teach tailwheel, but I'm not sure I'd know when to jump in to prevent the ground loop. Any uh, tips on that, Ben? Yeah, I don't have a hard and fast rule. Like it's going to happen at this point, right? First, I would just start with saying that I think ground loops get too much attention. There's too many. There's it's a myth. I think it's almost a myth that if you fly, you know, there's two. People always say there's two kinds of 
people, you know, there's people who have ground to move and people who will. And uh, I just, you know, I haven't, I've got, I'm about 800 hours into this uh, dual given and tailwheel and I haven't ground loop, not on purpose yet. I've summoned the ground loop monster, but he's never visited. It comes with, I guess I would say this, it comes with experience. So as you start to instruct, you start to get uncomfortable, right? And you're like, hey, that was uncomfortable. And you think about it later and you're like, next time, I'm not going to let it go that far. You know, one of the, I didn't have this benefit having a good mentor or tailwheel mentor or instructor to kind of help me along. Um, I kind of, I got my, my tailwheel endorsement a long time ago and then I came back to it and started instructing with like 20 hours, way not, not what you should do at all. Anyway, all that to say, um, what I do for students and people who are instructors who want to instruct tailwheel is I'll be your mentor. I'll play the dumb student. And I'll give you opportunities to jump in and um, I'll put you, I know what the scenarios are they're going to put you in. And so I can, I can play that part. So find someone that can do that for you. Find some, find, find an old man at your airport who's going to scare the shit out of you and say, Hey, I'm going to play, I'm going to play, I'm going to play an instructor and I want you to, you know, almost ground loop this thing. And um, you're not going to, because that person is going to know what to do and what not to do, but it is going to terrify you enough that you're never going to let a um, a student take it that far. For those who don't know what a ground loop is, uh, and Ben, you made fun of me all the time because you said it, I, I, I was always coming with the analogies, but I'll just explain it like this. And then you can just correct it into some sort of form of English. But I liken it to the concept of if you were in the grocery store and you had a shopping cart and you just turned the shopping cart around and you were pushing from the front of the shopping cart and you just took off running down an aisle and you're pushing the shopping cart backwards, basically, down the aisle, if at any point those wheels that are kind of squirrely in front of you get outside of the lateral bounds of the two wheels that are fixed in front of you, then you're going for a ride. <laughs> and that would be kind of a, a grocery store ground loop. Is that fair? Yeah, that's the perfect explanation. And the reason for that is because those car- the shopping carts are, the, I think, the best the best example there, when you push a shopping cart normally, like most humans do, right? Um, and you push the shopping cart straight and then you start a little bit of a turn with that shopping cart and you let go of it. It's going to stay in that turn. The reason for that is because the center of gravity is in front of the wheels closest to you or the biggest wheels, right? So center of gravity in a shopping cart is in the front of the main wheels. Same thing with a tricycle gear or plane. Center of gravity is in front of the main wheel. So when you start a turn, generally the tricycle is just going to continue to go in that direction. If you turn that um, shopping cart around backwards like a weirdo <laughs> and you start just the slightest turn with it, the CG is now behind the main wheels, right? So you can picture this. We've all done it probably. You're pushing it backwards and you start just a little bit of a turn and you let go of the cart. What's going to happen? the turn is going only going to increase and get more aggressive because the center of gravity is pulling in the direction of the of its momentum so the same thing with a with a tailwheel so we have to manage that cuz the cg is behind the main wheels dynamically unstable and that's a good reference Brian to kind of simplify it you can think about if the tailwheel gets outside of the main gear it you know you're getting in the danger zone Got a couple of uh, comparisons in the comments here. Uh, 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 Lord Alpha Juliet says it's it's like drifting a Porsche 911, uh, which Lord AJ would know a lot about. Um, uh, for me, it's a uh, it's a uh, high setting a motorcycle, which is uh, uh, avoid letting the rear swap with the front. Yeah. Um, so yeah, good explanation. Yeah. Ground loops are most often to happen when you are you've come into land. And you're trying to make a taxiway and you haven't um, got all the momentum out of the plane yet. And you start to turn that shopping cart and it continues to want to make that turn. Or uh, when you don't anticipate maybe on takeoff, the left-hand turning tendencies because you're sitting at a positive angle of attack. So you're going to start with more P factor than you would in a, you know, if you're sitting in a level, sitting in a level attitude. So, you know, trying to make turnoffs too quickly or adding power too quickly on takeoff, those are kind of some areas where that's going to happen. I, I never thought about that on takeoff. 
I, I, I was always focused yeah. on on the landing and removing speed. So what, what's a what's a rough uh, speed to make a to make a, a sharp turn uh, exiting uh, the runway? I, I would. I mean, it's going to be depend on your aircraft, but I mean, I would never. I would make sure that I was at my at the taxi speed that I feel safe taxiing that that aircraft at before I made um, a turn. Until you are really familiar with your plane and you kind of know what's you know what it's going to do. Yeah, I mean, Ben, I I I would love to talk about moments of fear because <laughs> I really enjoy that and. Um, <laughs> And, you know, I was thinking about what parts of, what parts of that experience had me nervous or uneasy. And then I was also thinking about what parts of that experience might've had you nervous or uneasy. <laughs> That's the more important question. And, and by the way, people should know that your 140 is a 140 alpha model. It's got big bush tires on it. And it's, um, I'll tell you when you're trying to figure out how to do a, um, a wheel landing and you're landing on asphalt with these giant balloons tires, you better get it right because it likes to send you back up. <laughs> it's like a, it's like an anti-gravity uh, device. But um, like on one hand, you allowed me to do things that, I mean, it was kind of, one of I just trusted you so much. So I just, I just said, if he's going to let me do this, then I guess it's fine. Like he's going to stop. It's his plane, you know, like he's, <laughs> like he's going to, if this is going south, he's going to stop me. And when you took me to, um, three, five KY, is that what it's called? Well, welcome, uh, field. welcome field. Yeah. When you took me to welcome field and I was doing, uh, and you had me do, do a, a, some, some grass landings there in between those, that tree line thing or whatever. And I remember one time we did it and there was a pretty good crosswind going and a lot of stuff going on. And I was, there's something about the tailwheel experience and when, especially when you get out there and you start kind of using it, at least on the cursory level that I've been able to so far, I kind of just felt like I couldn't believe that I did it. You know what I mean? Like it felt, it felt so different than just learning how to land a tricycle gear plane and then you get it down. There's something more about uh, the tailwheel experience where if you get something like that down, especially in a good crosswind or whatever, it's almost like you're so busy and you're so, and this is the thing that you were mentioning earlier is that the fight really starts also as soon as you get on the ground. It's not, you know, we're used to relinquishing, you know, and kind of putting our shoulders down a little bit like, okay, we got it down, but you just can't ever take your eye off the ball in those planes for a second. Um, so you, you almost kind of just, I kept waiting for you just to tell me like my controls, my controls, you know, <laughs> and, and sometimes you wouldn't, and I would actually land it. Um, and I, I would try to look out of the corner of my eye to see if you were helping me. And usually you weren't. So I have this thing when I get really scared, I, I can't talk. <laughs> <laughs> I should have mentioned that when we started training. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a mute response. Well, that's yeah, not yeah, good. No. <laughs> um, but I guess, but for me, the things that were, you know, there were other things that were just outside of that. Like I remember we were in the pattern and we were turning downwind to base and it was kind of one of those, have you ever done one of these before moments? And you just did a, um, like a forward, a turning slip to base, like a, sli how would you call that? It was like a, that's it. Yeah. A slipping turn. Yeah. A slipping turn in the pat, like just as a pattern turn. That was like one of those, oh, I actually was quite nervous because everything about private training, it's one thing if you're on final to be in a cross-controlled state in a tricycle gear plane in your training, because you're kind of, you're already kind of there and you're, you're managing things within this kind of equilibrium and a straight line. But when you did slipping turns, I was, it was like part of my brain was like, is this real? Is this, you know, <laughs> is this we're going to die? Yeah. <laughs> but it was, and we're still here to talk about it. But that, I, that's what I love too, is there's a lot of things I think that are maybe more in the tailwheel type of world that aren't even necessarily about, because once you get in the air, it's, it's just another airplane, but there's another way that you can kind of fly and, and approach things that's different. Yeah. I think that's go going back to, I don't know if we were live yet when we were when we we're discussing some of the difference of the tailwheel, but um, I've just found that tailwheel pilots tend to think differently a lot, you know, like it is a lot of, it tends to be older folks who, you know, oh, we don't need an airspeed indicator and, you know, stick and rudder and 
a lot of that I identify with myself and I try to inculcate that in my students. Um, it'd be embarrassing to me if a, if my student was, you know, two miles out on a base and lost an engine and put it in a field, not only embarrassing, but what a tragedy that, you know, I didn't teach them how to stay close enough to the airport. Like they'd flown a whole cross country and got so close and then, um, you know, lost it, you know, right there. So I think that's what you get with tailwheel and instruction a lot of times is you're going to find that um that that's what i found with people who instructed me is they're like why are you so far from the big it's just like they just have a a an old school kind of mindset that's just not taught in curriculums and so a slipping turn to you know a slipping base turn to final allows you to stay very close to the to the runway um it's a perfectly safe maneuver once you learned how to do it and we don't do enough slipping. Like I was very uncomfortable slipping um, when I first got my license. Um, And it's not necessarily something bad, you know, about my instructors. Um, It's just, there's so much to try to teach in in primary training that you just can't get to at all. Um, But that's something, you know, I encourage people to seek out tailwheel training and instructors who will teach you those things because we, we just learn so much about three, it's why a 3%, you know, glide pass and, watch the pathy and make sure you're on that. And um, it just makes me, I, I fly maybe very paranoid. And um, look at your slip indicator and make sure you're coordinated. They t- drill all that stuff yeah. into you on the tricycle stuff. Yeah. I want to give a quick plug to your school, Ben. There was a question, where are you located? Uh, uh, flywithben.com is his website. And correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Brian has only said it 6,000 times. You're at Music City Executive, which is yes. X-Ray November X-Ray. Did I get that right? Birmingham. Well, well, I actually do have a pretty good memory. Um, so y'all check them out. I will be checking them out. If I can get on his calendar, there's a very good chance of that happening. But uh, And what is your OnlyFans, Ben? <laughs> <laughs> X-Ray November X-Ray. <laughs> oh well you know now tell us a little bit about i mean because one of the things too that i i realized when i trained with you and it could just be that it's the only thing i know but i realized oh my god i want a 140 really bad i love your airplane tell us about the cessna 140 and the, the magic like why did you go that route and uh how's that been for you sure so I'm going to preface this by saying that I am not the Cessna 140 expert that maybe some people watching this or that will see it are. There's a great, and, I, and that's my first point actually, is that there is a awesome community around the one, 120, 140s. And there are people out there that, I mean, can go very deep on, uh, on the nuances of 140s. Um, I chose it because... I had the opportunity to fly one and I just, I kind of fell in love with it. I was stuck between that or a a Piper Cub. And because I wanted to teach primary students too, private pilot students, I needed all the uh, instruments so I could teach attitude flying so they could take their check rides in the plane and do all their training. So that's ultimately why I ended up with the 140. I'm not convinced that it's the best tailwheel training plane. So it does have the big, you know, spring steel landing gear that can, as you were mentioning, Brian can, you know, be kind of delicate. They're just a real booger um, because they can send you back into the air, you know, but my experience with cubs and carbon cubs, I mean, not dissimilar, you know, I mean, if you don't hit it right, they're going to, they're all going to send you back into the air. Anyway, the one, the 140, you know, I've heard it said they're good at everything. They're not great at anything. And that's kind of true. It's their, they're not fast, but they're not slow. They are comfortable, but there's get up, but you don't want to sit in them forever. Um, they're, you know, underpowered. They're not underpowered, but they're overpowered, all that kind of stuff. They're great for training. I mean, they're easy to do steep turns and stalls in. They're very forgiving. Carts are still pretty readily available. I specifically chose the A model, which is the last uh, iteration of them because they swept the landing gear forward three inches so makes nosing over a little bit more difficult to do they usually came with a a c90 engine so i wanted that ability to swing a a larger prop and have a little extra horsepower in the summer months and that's uh metal wings yeah and they're and they're metalized wings yep yep 
Yeah. That said, I mean, they're, they do have a very, uh, the 148 actually increased the, uh, useful load, uh, the gross, uh, weight, but, um, still pretty, a pretty low useful weight. So we have another question from our, our CFI friend, Nathan Ballard. Um, he's asking you, tell Will Ben, do you think there is any hope for loves to sideload Ben, <laughs> which I think he's referring to me, to land a tailwheel airplane? Or in a non-joking question, what do you see as the number one challenge for a tri-gear pilot learning tailwheel? I think it's a great question. It all comes down to longitudinal alignment. That's the hardest part of this. Again, they're dynamically unstable on the ground. In the air, they're just another plane. But because they're dynamically unstable on the ground, when you set it down, there's no room for error in your longitudinal alignment with your momentum. So that's the biggest challenge is just developing the sight picture for is my nose, is my longitude my nose knows the plane. Is it aligned with my direction of travel? And mm -hmm. we often harp on and we say all the time, center line, center line. It's mm -hmm. not necessarily about the center line. It's just that the center line is a very useful tool for knowing if we're, if the nose is pointed in the direction that, that we're traveling. Right. In a tricycle gear plane, as you guys know, I mean, you can come in and set it down in a little bit of a crab and the center of gravity in front of the main wheels is just going to straight in a, in a way of speaking. Um, but in the tail wheel, it's the reverse of that. It's going to pull the tail. It's going to try to swap ends on you. And I saw questions about the ground loop, like what, like, uh, what happens or will it tip over? Yeah. So if you get in a, if you come in and you're not longitudinally aligned and you know, the tail starts to seek the other end and you go around in a ground loop while you're weighing the outside, it's going to happen very quickly because you're at flying speed or, or fast. And that's, it's going to be a donut, right? Like if you've done a donut in your car, it's going to be like that. It's going to, the tail is going to whip around very quickly. And so the outside wing is going to have a tendency to drop. And then if you're not really paying attention, like if you've let go of the elevator and your tail comes up in that, then, you know, you're not only is your wing going to drop over, but your tail is going to come up. So you can actually end up doing a lot of damage to the plane. If you get in the ground oh, wow. loop, so you're supposed to ground loop turning into a prop strike, huh? Yeah. Yep. If you get into a ground loop, you're you are uh, you know you're supposed to steer into it with your ailerons because that'll put your outside wing aileron down, which you know hope might have enough energy to keep that wing from touching the ground. You should have the yoke on the way back, power out, and opposite brake. Did you get all that, Ben? It's lie. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm ready for it. You write I, that down. <laughs> it is. It is getting me more and more excited. Um, I, I have one last question, and um, I'm trying not to overthink. As you can tell, I've been hanging out with Brian a lot. Therefore, I seem to maybe overthink things a little bit more than I used to. Um, it, if I am, if I sign up at, on, online with you, I, which I'm assuming I can do, or call, or whatever I need yeah. to do. It, can you suggest anything I should do before I get there as, you know, anything to read or yep. any, yeah, I have, how, what would be the best way for me to prepare is my question. Well, this is the, the perfect opportunity for me to promote a talk that I'm going to give on May 7th. So yeah, EAA chapter 1343 at Gallatin um, is hosting a, uh, a, f a fast presentation. So the Tennessee director of the FAA safety team, David Zygmunt, great guy came to me and asked if I would do a tailwheel presentation. I said, hell no. Anyway, um, I eventually agreed to it. <laughs> and so May 7th at Gallatin Airport or Music City Executive, which is XNX, I'm doing a, a, a talk. It's going to be a 10 point high level kind of, hey, here's, here's the ground portion of what you would talk about before you actually jump in the plane. And uh, Casey Ahern from the Nashville 99's chapter will be joining me as well as uh, Anthony uh, Lee from Faithful Lee Aviation, who's a decathlon tailwheel instructor at Gallatin. Um, awesome. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be fun. So come to that if you can. But I have on my site linked several places. But if you look at my in my journal or my blog, you can find this. But I have a post, a series of six articles and written by, written by a guy named Steve Krug, who writes for AOPA magazine and others. Um, and then 
I think six videos. So, you know, before you come, um, I always highly recommend that people watch those videos. One of the videos specifically with Martin Pauly, I think his name is, uh, is probably the, the older gentleman in that video. I mean, I've never met him, but he has name is slipping me right now, but, um, I mean, the way he talks about Tailwheel, you couldn't get a better intro um, to it. So those those resources are great. The books are amazing too. Cool. So. Yeah. At, and the, at the end of the day, those books, those videos, and those articles are all saying the same thing. Keep the pointy end of the plane down the, in, in alignment with your momentum. You got that figured out? It's going to be fine. <laughs> don't be, what I'm, and what I'm saying is don't overthink it. Don't be scared of Tailwheel. Don't li- listen to the myth that you're going to ground loop. Stay within your minimums. Get a good right. instructor. Don't go out with a, someone who's like, hey, I got my tailwheel endorsement. You know, I'm I'm teaching tailwheel. Like, go go seek out the older person at airport who's been doing it for a while. And Right. Yeah. He, Nathan he, Ballard he, he, mentioned, it's, is it Doug Rosenthal? Doug, who you're yes, to that's of? it. Yep. yep. If I ever... I love, the, and, I love your recommendation, Ben, is don't... Don't don't go find an instructor that did exactly what I did, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And uh, well, Wendell Geek say- Mark is is saying exactly what I was thinking, which is uh, you said don't overthink it, and that is the uh, the hallmark of the Midlife Pilot podcast is that you know if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. We <laughs> tend to be way over prepared, and um, uh, you might call it neurotic uh, in that way. So yeah, you're you. You're saying take it by feel. Yeah. Use the, uh, yeah. 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 yeah fine. Yeah, I, sh- I, sh- I, sh- I showed up at Ben's hangar with like all these. I, I'm like, I have a Super 8 camera. I'm like, sh- <laughs> he's got a four person camera crew, uh, an audio engineer. Yeah. Everybody's sitting ready to go. And, and the funny thing is, my Super 8 camera is still, you know, 30 years newer than his airplane. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, though. But uh, um, one more quick question, and I'm curious to know this. Alpha Juliet, no chat asks. I know everybody's going to be different. Absolutely know that. But on in general, can you give us an idea of what the average time it takes to to get uh, the yeah. tail wheel ridden? I my students average between eight and twelve hours to get an endorsement. I I know instructors who require ten hours. Like, doesn't matter who you are. Like. 10 hours um, is the minimum for a tailwheel. I like that mentality. I, I know other instructors who have given tailwheel endorsements in an hour. And, um, you know, you really have to ask yourself if you're getting exposed to all the potentialities of what you're going to maybe see in the real world if you, you know, do it in one hour. I realize there, there are people who, you know, are... <laughs> Our modern day Rickenbackers, you know, and much better pilots than I am. So not saying it's impossible, but um, I would I would plan on eight eight hours at a minimum, um, but probably ten. And even like you know, I think Brian is a great example. He was like, um, I think you were maybe eight hours, if I remember right, Brian. When when I was like, hey, you're. I always like to ask when I when I get to a place where I see consistency. Um, I'm like, this person's ready. But then I asked the person, the pilot, I'm like, how do you feel? Like, are you ready? And so, you know, Brian was like, you know, I think I want one more hour. And then even after that, and this is not uncommon at all. I have, I have students who often are like, that's great. I have the endorsement. Like, I really feel like I can do this, but I'd love to keep coming back to, to build those skills, to, to, to really feel confident. And I, I admire that. Like I'm, I, I really admire people like that who are, who are like, yeah, like, I know I could do this, but I want you to stay in here for a few more hours um, just so I can relax, have a little fun. And how that usually works out is I'm in there and um, it's perfect for me because I'm not doing much, but I'm making money. <laughs> but you're, <laughs> but what's happening is you're, you're, I'm, I'm letting go and I'm not, and you, you may not realize it as a student, but I'm intentionally like, I'm just not doing anything. And after a while, you're like, wait, I'm paying this guy and I'm doing this just fine. Well, here's the thing too. I think part of the reason was because your hanger has such a nice sort of hang in it, the couches. And he's actually been a uh, singer, uh, the sage. I would like to just if you look. Ben Lehman and his hanger, he's got Japanese whiskeys, like all the stuff. And he's got, 
<laughs> if you go to the fridge, it's Perrier. It's not. <laughs> so that's, it's not that's me. I mean, I only drink soda water anyway. So it's um, not Aquafina. It's freaking it, Perrier. There'll so probably be a I, reservation. Of course I need one more hour. <laughs> there'll be a reservation probably before the night's over. I mean, he, he had me at Japanese whiskey and Perrier. Well, there you go. <laughs> How do you think I got over my anxiety about the whole thing? He would just. Awesome. <laughs> no, How but, do you think um, I got over the anxiety of teaching? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, well, I have to say that during my uh, primary training, I, I couldn't figure out what was happening with the instructor and the secondary instructor. And then I realized after a little bit that they were bored. And and it's like, that's that's actually kind of a good thing when, when you realize that the instructor is like, why am I even here? Yeah. Like that's okay, maybe that's actually a, a good thing that they're they're not even worried. They don't even tense up near the controls when you're coming in for a landing. They're just like, yeah. I'm just along for the ride, just burning time, yeah. whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, well, this has been uh, a, and most importantly, a lot of fun, but also very informative. And Ben, we really appreciate your time. And I am serious. Um, I would absolutely love to come up there. I may just come up there and hang out anyway. So I don't see any reason why we couldn't do that. You're, definitely, yeah. definitely a good call to do it, Ben. Uh, both Ben's. Ben yep. Ben Square, I think this is a good pairing. <laughs> it's kind of scary. Um, do we want to go ahead and and check out the review that was left on, uh, or we want to push it to next Yeah, I'll just, let me just read this review real yeah, quick. Yeah, this would be great. And then, uh, and then we'll, we'll get out of here. And, and uh, Ben Lehman, you're not allowed to leave yet. So I'm sorry. Okay. About that. Uh, in case you were wondering, in case your family's staring at you from the other side of this room that we're seeing you and they're wondering, when does it end? It doesn't. It doesn't. Um, it never ends. So, uh, no, we, we obviously uh, love it when people leave reviews on Apple Podcasts or any of the places. And we try to read them, so uh, we're gonna we're gonna make this happen. We'll read this one um, today, if that's all right. Ben, uh, Ted, you guys are okay with me reading this review real quick? All right, it's from barely a pilot, a Patreon member. Patreon member, yes. It has taken me far too long to leave this review. I've been flying for a year, and Midlife Pilot Podcast has been with me every step of the way. As soon as I started flight school, I began looking for content to help me in my training. I tried various aviation podcasts, but I felt overwhelmed by most of them. Uh, see, so we, <laughs> underwhelmed is where it's at, guys. Um, so uh, the Midlife Pilot podcast was essential for helping me feel like I wasn't alone in my struggles to learn to fly. The community on Discord and YouTube improves upon this by providing a place to share experiences that helped me realize that I wasn't the only pilot that took forever to get the hang of landings and also emphasizes the importance of being safe. While commercially geared pilots would also benefit from listening to this podcast, I think it stands out as an excellent resource for the everyday flying for fun pilot. And I just have to say thanks because um, that is the whole, for me personally, that is the whole reason I even got involved with this whole thing to begin with because I didn't have that community. I didn't have any of that. So to see that we can make something and then it serves as that for people when they're coming into it, uh, that's, you can't, doesn't get any better than that. So thank you for that. Absolutely. And I want to just make a quick add to that. I, I think he kind of summed up what the whole uh, essence of the podcast is. It's the flying for fun pilots. I think that kind of encapsulates because you can still be fly professionally and also be yeah. out there flying for fun. So I thought that uh, encapsulated it very well. So thank you again, barely a pilot for that. Uh, and Ben, we, uh, Ben Lehman, we, we re really appreciate your time, and uh, it, was, it was great to meet you, and uh, look forward to seeing you guys soon. You too. I, w I wanted to say thank you as well. Thanks for uh, the opportunity, and uh, I enjoy talking about this, so thanks for uh, having me on. It's fun. Yep. Two dates for you to remember. May 7th, where we'll have Ben Lehman uh, at the EAA chapter there at X-Ray, November X-Ray Airport uh, for their WINGS program. And the second date you need to remember is actually a weekend, April 26th through the 28th. Did I get those dates right? Yep. I think I did. The Midlife Pilot Fly-In at Juliet Whiskey November. A lot of airports up in that area. Make sure we get them right. Uh, yeah. uh, John Toon Airport. Uh, it's the Midlife Pilot Fly-In. If you will go to our website and fill out the survey and give us an, and let us know if you're coming or not in your plane, commercially, hitchhiking, however it's going to be. Um, we 
we're up to, I think, 40 people, 41. I think I did a count earlier this evening. Um, we love it. Keep it coming. Um, all the information's in there. So anything else gentlemen, that I've left out or anything for the good of the order? Oh, uh, Ted. I got, I got two things over here. First is merch is available again. So it's been a little while since we've been able to have merch. Uh, I have a uh, package of it sitting here. You can go to our website, midlifepilotpodcast.com. There's a, a link at the top for merch and you can go buy a couple of things. We've got shirts and polos and, uh, and uh, tumblers and coffee cups. So uh, just try to get some basics set back up there so that people get the merch that they wanted. The second is we can't forget, speaking of having really nice hangers, got to talk about Alyssa Miller. Uh, congrats, oh. Alyssa, on passing your instrument check ride. Yeah. It was uh, kind of a, a epic, you know, weather fail experience for Alyssa. And so she finally got that done even a day earlier than it was scheduled. And uh, uh, there's going to be a, a uh, instrument check ride debrief uh, tomorrow night for those who are listening to this live. And uh, but the main thing is congrats, Alyssa. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Model of patience. As many yeah. as those guys rescheduled. I, I think I would have uh, gone crazy. So. Awesome, guys. It was been a, a great night. Fun potting with you guys. Um, y'all enjoy the rest of your week, and we will catch you next time on the Midlife Pilot Podcast. Good night, everybody. <laughs>